Yeah, it's better. Um, yeah, NFTs, as you, you, you are aware, usually more copyrighted materials such as artwork, photograph, music, or videos. Therefore, the first step uh, when starting an NFT business is to verify lawful partition of rights to these materials. So this includes verifying the partition of publicity or naming rights to known copyright materials or materials that are included in the copyright materials. Um, the mentioned handbook explains these issues in detail. It is also important to verify the scope of use that is permitted by the rights holders as well as whether the rights holder can make representation and warranties on the copyright materials. And the next issue is, is revenue sharing. NFT, NFTs can generate revenue when they are first minted as well as when they are resold. If the issue of sharing this revenue is not discussed beforehand, it may lead to potential disputes. Additionally, if a specific platform is going to be used for the NFT business, or if the platform is going to be operated directly by the NFT business, issues like terms and conditions, data protection, or the responsibility of telecommunication businesses should be addressed. Lastly, the licenses that grant the right to use materials for NFTs may have a limited time period. In this case, it is important to address in detail how NFTs will be handled after the license period. Um, so in that case, uh, more sp I have more specific questions. So if someone has the right to use copyrighted material to meet NFTs, is that person allowed to modify the copyrighted work? Also, if that person, a person purchases an NFT, can that person collect the copyright work that is linked to the NFT and print them out in hard copies or display them online for promotional purposes? I think that would be a question that would interest a lot of people dealing with NFT artworks. Yes. <laughs> uh, you have two questions. For the first question, the, the issue is whether the modification would be who would infringe it, uh, the author's moral rights or the right to creative derivative work. If light holders, who is not the author of the copyright materials, makes substantial changes to the original work, it might influence the author's moral rights, namely the right of integrity. Also, modifying the copyright materials may result in a derivative work and doing so without purchasing the right to creative de derivative works may constitute infringement of the author's right to creative derivative work. Under Korean copyright law, the right to creative de derivative works does not automatically transfer on-site copyright ownership. Therefore, it is important to confirm the partition of the right to Creative derivative works. And second question: um, Transmission, reproduction, and dis distribution of the copyrighted materials would be at issue. Uh, generally, the permit permissible use of purchased NFT should be clearly stated on the NFT sales page or the seller's website. In cases where a dedicated exchange is making the sale on behalf of the owner, these terms and conditions should provide uh, guidance for that. If it is stated that online display or reproduction is allowed, allowed for purchased NFTs, the NFT buyer should be able to use the copyrighted materials for online display or reproduction for promotional purpose. But if there is no such indication, the NFT buyer should seek permission for such use from the light world. 
you know, for your question. And another question I had is, I think there are a lot of discussions going on on whether and how to regulate NFT artworks. And like other countries, Korea heavily regulate financial industry. And I believe there are discussions in Korea going on on whether to regulate um, and have the NFT artworks subject to the financial Regulations. Can you tell us more about the discussions going on? I'd like to more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As you pointed, uh, pointed out, Korea, South Korea, like many other countries, maintain rigorous financial regulations. Therefore, whether NFTs will be subject to financial regulation is being extensively discussed in Korea. In Korea. Uh, relevant Korean laws in this regard are the enforcement decree of the Act on Reporting and Use of Certain Financial tra Transaction Information and the Financial Investment Services and Capital Markets Act. Mm. Under the enforcement decree, the key question is whether NFTs qualify as virtual assets or digitally tradable electronic records with economic value. Different views exist. Some people view the NFTs directly fall under the definition of virtual assets as per the current Korean law, while others view that NFTs qualify as virtual assets only if they function as a payment or investment instrument. If NFTs do fall under the definition of virtual assets, platform operators dealing with NFT, NFTs could face criminal penalties for operating business without proper reporting. Um, about this, Korean financial authorities have not reached uh, a conclusive stance on this issue. However, at least for those NFTs that function as payment or investment instrument, there seems to be a consensus that they constitute virtual assets under the enforcement de decree. And another issue is whether NFTs qualify as securities under the Capital Markets Act. If NFTs are classified as securities and NFT trading platforms, we would need to submit securities, securities registration document to the Financial Services Commission and obtain a uh, proper license to broker NFT trading. Okay, Korean financial authorities have not yet provided clear guidance on this matter. However, considering their past responses to cases like Musical, um, which involved Fractional investment in music copyrighted materials. So it is generally understood that the Financial Services Commission tends to classify NFTs securities. Finally, it is important to keep in mind that uh, even if the term NFT is being used, the Enforcement Decree or Capital Markets Act will continue to apply to virtual assets or securities that are under the guise of NFTs. In this case, it is important to, important to respond to the relevant laws accordingly as the inherent nature of virtual assets or securities would remain unchanged even if they become associated with NFTs. That's my answer. <laughs> so I guess NFTs can be regulated differently based on how it is being used. <clears throat> and uh, based on Mr. Lee's uh, explanation, I think it's often uh, classified as securities in Korea. That's how we view it, um, NFTs in Korea. And also, NFTs are often discussed in the context of gaming industry. And uh, the last question I had to you is that because in Korea, the play to earn, play P2E, um, 
games are prohibited. And I think there are discussions on how to deal with those issues. And so please, uh, can you tell us um, the developments or any background that are important related to this issue? Korea game is very big industry, but the P2 game uh, in Korea is banned. So as you said, P2 games are available in other countries, but totally banned in South Korea. Uh, consequently, Korean game companies that are developing and offering P2 games are providing their services exclusively to only overseas users. This restriction traces back to Korea's gaming regulation, uh, which came into effect in response to a uh, serious societal destruction caused by the one of the arcade game Sea Story or uh, in Korea Padayagi in 2004, yeah, 20 years ago. So in 2004, Korea experienced a serious social issue due to the boom of this arcade game history. Uh, the game was highly addictive and had gambling elements such as allowing, allowing players to exchange in game points for uh, cash. So it led to a surge of gambling addicts and credit defaulters and even some incidents of suicide. So drawing from this experience, the Korean government established strict regulatory measures, including rating classification for games and prohibition of games with exchange loot and gambling-like elements. This, these regulations have been continued to this way today. So under this regulatory framework, P2 game play on games are Prohibited in Korea because they have have the exchangeability element. Also, given the uh, volatility of cryptocurrencies or NFTs, provided through the P2 games, these games are likely to be considered to have the gambling-like elements. So, not only this year, the Seoul Admi Administrative Court recognize that NFTs and items with potential monetary value provided in games like Five Stars or Hero Blaze, Three Kingdoms uh, constitute rewards with gambling elements which are uh, still prohibited by the law. So consequently, the court ruled that these games cannot be offered in South Korea. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for your explanations and uh, insights. Um, next, I have a more general question to Mr. Kim. So we would like to hear from you um, how NFTs are used in the art world. Mm -hmm. So, there are a couple of key aspects to understand. The art world, there are a couple of different objects. One is provenance of art pieces. You know, how to keep track of them and how to make sure you can query them easily and then know what the status of it is and whatnot. Uh, second is kind of raw. Well, I mean, nature of art is coming up with new experiences. So I guess it's more of a you know, creator's problem. Okay, how do we use this to create new experiences? I think a third issue is around kind of certificates of ownership around particular art pieces. So I think when it comes to NFTs, uh, our people are looking at areas where, okay, how do we use this to keep track of particular art pieces? As well as obviously certificate, you know, you can admit NFT and maybe it says something about the ownership or maybe it can provide fractional ownership of the art piece. But I mean, there's the new experience part is quite interesting because that's, there's a lot of exploration there. So for instance, what if you can have a ticket to an art concert or a museum?
museum, uh, especially if you go to a museum that has an NFT, and that NFT happens to contain a lot of contents that provides you with new and interesting experience. Maybe there's a song inside of it, maybe there's a, a really interesting collectible inside of it that people want to go, uh, people want to collect. Uh, like maybe, a, maybe this is a bizarre example, but uh, I don't know, let's say you can turn Pokemon cards into art. I think it contains like a rare Pokemon card, and it's like randomized. And now you know people are going to watch it too. Uh, to, to go to the event, whoever the Pokemon card is too small. Uh, so that, I think that's an interesting uh, example. But, uh, but I think the possibilities of what kind of new experiences can be created, uh, that's, that's up to the creators. So you explained to us about the visual art part of NFTs, and um, could you explain more on how the market thinks value of fine art NFTs, and if there are any problems? So could you specify on the evaluation of fine art? Let me think about that. So, well, I think I can answer that from a perspective of the market forces uh, supply and demand. So, I think the functionality of NFT is it almost asceticizes your, okay, maybe I would say that work is, I'm not sure if there's a legal context to it. It wraps ownership or certificate or even thing that contains an experience like new experiences as an entity that could be transacted. So I think in terms of valuation, I think if the current valuation of art is now done through auctions, uh, which, which is done in, I think, in, in personal settings. Exactly what the auction mechanisms are, you know, but people bid. You can have a Dutch auction, you can have a, uh, I think the highest bidder wins the art kind of auction. So that's the, the, the price of the mechanism itself is very likely to change just because of how people trade NFTs and what market mechanisms we can put on top of it. Uh, I'll say that's not a, not a exactly solved problem. Option types, and that's the realm of uh, the economists at the moment. Yeah. So, um, how do you think um, can NFT enhance the value of physical art assets? Do you have any opinion on that? How, how do you think can NFT? enhance the value of physical art assets? So I think, yeah, on the enhancement part, it's a more natural to both your experiences and the provenance part. I think provenance just validates it more. Because uh, if you're not sure if this art piece is forged or, or uh, maybe it's, you're not quite sure if there's a damage to it, and when it occurred. And if you can't keep track of that, obviously it's going to change people's perceptions and evaluations. I think there are new experiences, of course, if you have an art piece and then you can create a whole ecosystem around the experiences of how people come to see it, how people engage with it. So, you know, because art, I think valuation is very perception and how people interact with it and engage with it. So I, so I, frankly, it's, it's really up to the creativity of the people who are, who are building these things. And whether they really understand what message they want to portray, or if they don't have a message, what they want to show to people. you also tell us a little bit more of what will be the impact of current and future regulations on NFTs? So, I 
think most people look at it from trading of securities or assets point of view. So I think from, from that, uh, the two things to cover. I think first is obviously KYC and the amount uh, they pay central to their customer and anti money laundering. I think on the KYC side, it's, it's just about there's somebody who's buying and selling these things, are they verified people? Or are they just anonymous and you can't track them? Uh, obviously, big, big issue there, especially, you know, who knows what if someone from uh, certain designated countries that is buying up all those assets and then there's an embargo uh, that could be a, a gray area uh, a geopolitical and uh, geopolitical gray area uh, so the ML kind of similar deal what if these entities contain I don't know, uh, snippets of information as to I don't know, possibly uh, potentially Swiss bank accounts or uh, wallets that contain see key phrases to all us that contain different uh, type of assets that's not kind of teased up or real assets. Um, so that could be an issue. So I think so those things seem to those are going to be I think price for regulations that come in. I think it's also uh, maybe this is a little less discussed uh, in, in the art world uh, it, there's a bit of overlap of AI, I think there's a lot of AI art coming out trying to copy that could potentially copy the style of a particular artist. So that could be an issue. Uh, I think that's, uh, there's been discussions on using NFTs to, how do you say it, uh, to counter the I think people have a weak solution. I am not aware of it. But there's an area where I think regulation also to look into because there's there's always a technical aspect, a legal aspect, and a cultural aspect to these to, to make sure the models work in a sustainable way or the business models work in a sustainable way. So I think that's probably the bit of the regulation comes in. Thank you very much. Um, my question is for the general and thank you for sharing your thoughts on uh, different issues. So, um, this is Yenstra. Um, I have more specific questions for you. Uh, we're talking about a lot of collaborations these days, and we hear a lot about collaborations between mushroom brands and artists, or between two different brands. For example, a few years ago, we saw a collaboration between Fiction and Disney, and we also saw um, a collaboration between <coughs> Louis Vuitton and Takashi Murakami, for example. And so with tangible products, uh, the collaboration is pretty straightforward. And do you see any difference uh, in NFTs? Is NFT collaboration any different from um, collaboration for tangible products? Thank you. Uh, there's definitely greater potential for uh, collaborators to sort of go rogue in the NFT sphere. Um, to back up for a moment, copyright collaboration is when uh, more than one person contributes to creating a work that's copyrighted. And then the result of that, absent any other agreement, is that you fully co-own that work. So three people work together to make a sculpture, all three of them could issue sub-license license that work to anyone else as long as that license is not exclusive and they then share their profits with their other collaborators, there's no limitation on what they can do with that. Um, and when you have uh, big brand names like Gucci and Disney, um, or actually recently there's a new NFT collaboration between people and Madonna coming out. Um, or might have already dropped. Um, then you've got another concern where, you know, Gucci, I'm sure, would not want Disney to license their collaboration to Walmart for the sake of their reputation. Um, so it's really 
a question of getting that into an agreement and one of the great things about NFTs is that they all have those <laughs> agreements built in. Um, and also, the second question that some people are asserting is whether the creation of the NFT is enough to qualify you as a collaborator in the work. Um, and as was previously explained, an NFT is you're taking a digital item and you're pairing it to the blockchain. The blockchain is usually not itself copyrightable. So the smart contract's not going to be copyrightable. So really, you've got a digital item that is the subject that may be eligible for copyright protection. So the person who helps mint that into an NFT, they're not contributing something that in and of itself would be eligible for copyright protection. So they're, uh, under US law, probably not going to be deemed a collaborator. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> can, can I ask you a question that kind of builds off of that? Sure. Um, so, so let's say, if this is a bad question, I apologize. Right? I, don't, I don't know, so I don't know what I'm not, but I don't know what to ask. So let, let's say, hypothetically, I, I want to make a picture of a tooth, and I want to like, make it into an NFT, right? And we all have, I think everybody here has teeth, right? So we all have teeth. It's, I don't know if that's something that's like inherently generic or like available. It seems like if you take a picture of a tooth, then that picture, like that singular picture, then okay, fine, like that's, that's yours, right? You're, a, you're an artist and you took the picture or you paint a picture of a tooth. But if you're like, hey, I want to be the guy, I, by the way, I don't, but let's pretend like I want to be the guy that makes teeth NFTs. Mm -hmm. Can I protect that, like the idea of I, the, you know, the teeth NFT, I'm going to sew up that market. Like, that's going to be mine. Is that, does this question make sense? I'm sorry. I think it does. Okay. Um, the, the idea is that if you're taking pictures of teeth, I mean... I'm not this guy, by the way. I'm not going around taking pictures of these teeth. Don't worry. I, 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 no, the photographs are an area where a lot of people, it, it does seem like we often are very much pushing the boundaries of what is copyright original or creative enough. For copyright, I, I mean, we, I represent a lot of, you know, like auction houses, and we get this all the time where we're taking a picture of a coin or a baseball, you know, collectible or something, and you're just taking the photograph to show the item as accurately as possible. So the extent to which it is creative is we're sort of pushing the envelope when we argue that in court, which, you know, we do, and it's there is case law that finds that that is creative, that you've chosen the light, you've chosen the background, you've chosen which specific tooth and which mouth you're going to photograph. But So that photograph is a work eligible for copyright protection. If you took that photograph and you printed it out and you stuck it on telephone poles or you put it on billboards, those means of displaying it are not going to be a new copyrightable work. Okay. The photograph is the copyrightable work. So similarly, NFTs, attaching it to the blockchain doesn't create a new expression. It's the same one work. So you, whoever owns that, cop that copyright of the photograph is going to own the copyright in the NFTs. And if you need somebody to help you mint it into an NFT, same as if you needed somebody to help you put it on the billboard. That doesn't add to the copyrightability of it. So, so okay, I, I think that answers it. Just to, to, to ask it back, it's like, I can't be the teeth NFT guy, right? If that comes out of the gate. Someone else yeah. is like, oh, I can make a tooth NFT as well, because we all have teeth, and that's not like something that was just an original character or something. Therefore, I, I can't, I don't know if I'd be able to protect like sculpture rights in a tooth. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, if, if you made enough teeth NFT and you had a style and a brand built up, you could then argue that someone is copying your brand and then that's, they, they that's not copyright. Oh, yeah. Okay. Pardon me? What, the last thing you said? What the the medium, like you said, it's not, it's oh, not like, yeah. oh, this is a new expression. I thought the example of like putting it on billboards or on telephone poles, that doesn't transform 
something that might no. otherwise be argued that no, it might it might an infringement argument in affect like the scope of damages or something if it's stepping on the toes of your customers, but yeah, it's not going to affect the infringement itself. I uh, too, I thought that um, a part of a unique um, value of the NFT had to do with the fact that the blockchain is its authenticator and that um, that idea that there's only one of it, uh, setting aside what the creative expression is, but the idea that there's only one of it could contribute to its value. Uh, I heard Kevin, you know, many things that contribute to the value of an artwork, you know, some of which are real and ephemeral, but I thought that uh, that was a part of the idea of its value that not only is it, it is unique because in part it incorporates the blockchain or its authenticity. And so back to the question of whether the person who mines the blockchain, I don't know what that's about, but whether the person who mines the blockchain and then works with the artist to embed it, I'm just posing the question whether it's so, it's unclear whether that contributor is not a collaborator, uh, but I just... No, it's a good question to ask. I should have been more clear. Um, my understanding, and can you correct me, is that mining blockchain is essentially solving a mathematical equation. Yes. Mathematical equations are not uh, eligible for copyright protection under US law. That is, I think, mainly a public policy sort of decision. Yes. Um, so that doesn't get you to that. I, th I agree with you. There is value and uh, in the art world, there is originality in sort of the sense of rarity, which does add to value, and there's originality in the sense of creativity of expression, which is what makes you eligible for the specific copyright protection. So something, so having it on the blockchain, having that uh, verification of the provenance, which does add tremendously to a lot of collectibles value, does have that value it just isn't going to necessarily get you the exclusive rights to distribute or copy or pursue statutory damages the way that copyright law will get you. I think that actually leads yes. to our next question, right? <laughs> Because the next question I had was whether the act of minting an NFT uh, transforms the digital item enough to constitute fair use of underlying IP you don't already own. So that was my question. I think you can um, provide a little bit more insight on that. And also, I wanted to um, also point out that in addition to collaboration that we um, discussed before, um, a lot of times artists are incorporating the work of others in their own work. So for example, <clears throat> Musicians assemble portions of other songs in their songs. And uh, Andy Warhol, for example, is very famous for colorized uh, photographs of celebrities, um, such as Marilyn Monroe or Prince. So, in that context, uh, I think I would like to hear more about the fair use and minting process. And also, uh, based on your um, experience, if um, an act constitutes my punishment, <laughs> Do you have any experience of take takedowns from, for example, platforms such as OpenSea or SuperRare? You, you can share that experience with us. That would be very helpful. Thank you. So now we're moving on to making an NFT using uh, IP you don't own. Um, so there's sort of two main categories that we're running into in the art collectibles field. The um, in terms of the, situations where it is legally permissible to use someone else's IP in your NFT. The first um, is the nominative fair use exception, which uh, we see there's currently a case going on. Uh, Nike is suing StockX. Uh, StockX is a company that sells online uh, collectible sneakers, and they also have a vault uh, storage facility, so you can go on their website and you can 
buy and sell sneakers that all stay in this vault, they're protected, no one has to worry about shipping costs or risk of loss on delivery or damage or anything like that. Um, we're actually seeing vaults you know, popping up all over the place in the collectibles field, especially sports right now, but I think that might just be because sports collectibles are very hot in the, in the US. Um, eBay, Collectors Universe, some of even the sports car manufacturers, I think, are getting their own vaults going. Mm -hmm. Um, but StockX is the first to be doing an NFT as the proof of ownership for the item that's in the vault. So you see NFTs on the, plat on the StockX platform, and you're buying an NFT for a Nike sneaker, and that gets transferred to your possession, and then you can sell that on, or you can redeem it, and you can turn it into StockX. They'll burn the NFT and deliver the pair of sneakers that was in storage to you. Um, and so that, Nike brought a lawsuit saying you're using our logo in these images of the Nike sneakers that you're displaying on the NFTs. Um, and the nominative fair use exception usually would be, would uh, allow for what StockX is doing. Um, we see this a lot in collectibles that you, if you're trying to sell a photo, famous photograph, you've got to show a picture of the famous photograph online. So you've got to show people what they're buying, so there's an exception there that allows you to do so. Uh, the real problem with the StockX Nike case right now is that it turns out not all the sneakers are genuine. So they're selling fake Nike sneakers using Nike logo in NFTs, and that that's where they're out of line, and it raises an issue with some of with the use of NFTs as proof of ownership of an item. That when you've got a physical item that you're connecting an NFT to, there's there's always going to be some human factor that is committing to pair, keeping that physical item paired to the NFT, and whether that's a QR code stuck on the back of a canvas painting, or a company like StockX verifying this is actually what we have in our vault, and we're not gonna you know, change or transfer that until we get our NFT back. There still is always going to be that trust, that issue there, and a liability concern for StockX as somebody who's not apparently in the business of also authenticating the sneakers. Um, but going back to the copyright abilities, um, usually making an NFT that just displays the item that, it's, that that NFT is certifying ownership of would not constitute copyright infringement on its face. Um, the second issue that we're seeing is this transformative fair use, where someone's using a copyrighted image and incorporating it into what they're creating to make something new, a new work of art. And like I said, we've seen this in physical art before, um, and we're seeing it in the NFT sphere, especially in videos. Um, there's an interesting case of a, an artist who uh, draws hyper-realistic drawings, you know, the kind that look like a photograph, um, and she made one of a famous photograph of Andy Warhol and Basquiat. And the photographer came after her for copyright infringement. Your, the fact that you drew this instead of this printed out a copy does not change the fact that it's identical. And so that was genuine copyright infringement. But instead of just destroying it, as she was uh, told to by the cease and desist letter, she took a video of herself painting over it turned that video into an NFT and called it copyright infringement. And that sold for a couple thousand dollars, I believe, last I heard. Um, and so that is, I mean, there's a little bit of an argument there, a gray area as to whether or not that would be transformative use. We've had a number, you know, copyright law when it comes to that transformative use issue, it's very subjective and you are very often just stuck with the opinion of how much you convinced your judge and jury of in that specific instance. The idea is you have to say something different 
you have to say something new with what you're doing to or around the original work. Um, the example Dayun gave earlier of uh, the Andy Warhol print copy was actually recently ruled to be copyright infringement. He took a photograph, black and white, added all that colorization, and it's been you know around for years, and now the photographers come in saying, you didn't you owe me license fees. And the court agreed, saying the, the judge didn't see any <laughs> new value or statement in what Andy Warhol did, that it was mainly just adding color. So we didn't get anything new there. Um, and obviously that that piece won't be destroyed, they'll just pay a license fee. But uh, there definitely is a risk factor in incorporating someone else's work in your art. There's always going to be that potential. Um, and with NFTs, there's sort of a unique instance where the NFT is being held on this platform that's outside of the owner's control to a certain extent. We've had cases where, um, for example, uh, I represent a company that authenticates rare coins. And so they, ha they take and post high resolution photographs of all the you know, rare coins they've created over the years. And somebody, when the NFTs first came out a few years, you know, how many ever years ago, said, well, wouldn't it be cool? You'll never own this coin that sold for $11 million last year, but here's a high resolution NFT where I take the photographs and I make it spin, and you can buy that, and that's the next best thing. Of course, the person who made that never owned or had possession of that $11 million coin either, so they got the photo from scraping our client's website, so we issued a takedown notice under the DMCA, which, and all of a sudden, that was gone. They, I mean, the platforms, the, uh, for those who don't know, the DMCA is sort of an add-on to the Copyright Act. It allows several provisions um, trying to keep up with technological issues for copyright protections. Um, but one thing that they do is provide a safe harbor for online platforms. So if you uh, have a platform that you let other people post pictures or written content on, you won't be liable if somebody posts something on there that is copyright infringement of someone else's work. You won't be liable if you follow the DMCA procedures, which more or less state that you have to be available for someone to come in and say, this is my copyrighted work, they don't have permission to post it, please take it down. And there's a, pol a, a policy for that, those platforms to argue, push back and say, we don't think this is your work, but more often than not, they're just gonna stay out of it as much as possible and take it down immediately. And for the person who owns that NFT, it's very unfortunate because in that case with the coin, someone had bought it and they had paid however many Ethereum to own that item and then all of a sudden they can log on the next day and their item is gone. Promise to send other two questions. No, you're all right. Um, so I, I don't think Baker has that, like, so we heard a lot about the Hermes case when it was working through. And I'm not sure if you guys addressed it, I just have other second side thoughts, like retreading, but I was curious because that was that seemed fairly high profile. And it also seemed like there were there was some turning on the backs there with that case, uh, where there may have been communications about let let's make a lot of money on the artist side, which didn't like help the argument. This is just artistic expression. But is that the I, I don't know how that how that turned out, but is it true? So if I bought like one of those Hermes NFTs, is it just gone? Like I made an investment into something and. Like it, it ultimately didn't have value because it shouldn't have been created in the first place. Almost like receiving stolen property and you don't get to do it, or? Yeah, there's, I mean, one of the ways that you handle copyright infringement is in order to destroy the work. That's something that a copyright owner can seek from a court judgment. So that is a possibility. Um, I don't know if that's what happened there or if the other, the other option is often a licensing fee will be imposed as a monetary judgment that you have to pay. Um, but yeah, in terms of when those NFTs are taken down and destroyed, you're essentially left with nothing but a potential claim against the person who sold it to you. 
you know, and however far back that goes to the original mentor of the NFT. So especially considering how widespread the platforms are, the person who minted that NFT could be well out of your jurisdiction, they could be somewhat anonymous that you're having trouble tracking down. Um, they can be judgment proof. It, it can be a very sort of risky situation, which is part of why determining the provenance and who has the rights to use that work, um, it's a risk. And some of these NFTs, people, people go into it thinking it's risky, but it's an investment opportunity. It could be the next Bitcoin sort of start the next people. No one knows what it's gonna go, what's gonna happen, so they're taking that risk. Now that all of you explained to us about the team today, could you tell us more about um, how United States is regulating NFT based on your experience as a in the United States? Sure. So the main regulation we're seeing uh, right now is securities. Uh, there is recently, um, I think it's September, which was just last month, um, what is it? Stoner Cats 2 settled with the SEC for $1 million civil penalty payment. Um, it was a pretty, a pretty straightforward, easy case for the SEC to start out with going after an NFT as a security. Uh, Stoner Cats 2 was apparently an animated web series, and they were raising money to keep making them by selling 10,000 NFTs for about $800 a pop. So they made it good amount of money off of it, but they were promoting these by talking about the potential uh, of the future episodes that they were going to make with the money they were raising. So they were talking, you know, their marketing is based on, oh, we have these great actors, we have this great director, all of that sort of thing. So the value of the NFT was promoted as being based on future performance of the web series. And uh, in the U.S., under the Howey test, where, which is the general application for determining securities, uh, we have three main factors. You have an investment of money in a common enterprise and with the expectation that the profits are going to be derived by the entrepreneurial or managerial actions of someone else. So that the Stoner Cats offering was pretty straightforward that it was a securities offering. They were, Bennett, they were saying this is going to be worth something because we're going to take your money and we're going to go do something with it and make your NFTs worth more money in the future. Um, so they just settled with that. We have a slightly more complex case currently pending in the Southern District of New York. Um, I don't believe the SEC is involved yet, but Dapper Labs is a company that created the Flow blockchain, and they got an exclusive license with the NBA to issue Top Shot Moments, which are uh, NFTs featuring short video clips of various NBA players, you know, best performances. And they were selling these on their blockchain. But something that some of these uh, companies issuing NFTs run into is that uh, we talk about how the smart contract can provide for them to take a cut of future sales of the NFTs that are sold on and on, but apparently that's been very difficult to enforce when the NFT has been transferred to a different platform. So in order to ensure that they continue to get a cut of that and in order to ensure that their own blockchain has a decent enough following and people aren't just buying off of it and going to OpenSea or somewhere else, they were prohibiting anyone from moving the NFTs off of their blockchain. And they were also apparently making uh, cashing out uh, a little difficult. But the, uh, they tried to make a motion to dismiss in this case, and the judge has denied it, finding, you know, slightly better than even odds that they'll succeed in proving that this is a security offering. But the fact that they are propping up their own blockchain with these NFTs, and that the NFTs uh, rely, therefore, entirely on how well the blockchain itself is doing and that platform is doing, makes those NFTs essentially a security, even though that's not how they were necessarily marketed. Um, 
Um, so we'll be keeping an eye on that, that case. Thank you very much for a very interesting illustration of the cases going on in the United States. And also, um, in addition to that, if you could um, ex um, share your thoughts on um, what new uses you see uh, related to the NFTs in the United States, and if that raises any new legal questions, can you also share your thoughts on this? So like I said earlier, we're seeing a lot of the vault storage popping up um, <laughs> for collectibles. I think we're also gonna be seeing that more and more in the art world because the more bulky and difficult or expensive something is to ship or store or preserve, the more uh, enticing it is to pay somebody else to do all of it for you. Um, but something that has to be kept in mind with NFT uh, representing the ownership of those items in storage is the fact that those smart contracts are not uh, subject to amendments. I know I always, I'm talking to them blue in the face with my clients every week, telling them, get this in writing, get this in writing. But uh, we sort of take for granted the fact that a contract can be amended if you need, if you figure out something's too vague, you think of your store, you know, if you're paying a lease for an office or a storage space, that gets renewed, those charges go up. We have these, you know, situations where you want to be able to revise those and the NFT as a contract poses a new uh, sort of uh, uh, challenge for us as lawyers in terms of thinking even further down the road and keeping in mind that we can't amend these, uh, that you would have to submit and burn the NFT and issue a new one, but then you're losing your provenance. I think some people are working on a back end where they essentially write another smart contract and just bind it to the first one, and that gets very bulky. Um, so, some, so again, if you've got any sort of fees, it makes sense if you're if you've got an NFT that represents an item in storage. It makes sense that that smart contract would provide for a storage fee. But if you're changing it, you would have to also build in how you're going to incrementally increase those storage fees going forward when you're writing the initial contract. Um, it also poses an issue with the tax situations um, with these with these NFTs certifying items in vaults. We've um, some of these companies are advertising the fact that their vault is in a tax-free state as a benefit, and of course, then you've got the question of whether that actually is a way to avoid sales and use tax if. Someone in New York buys an item that's in storage in a vault in Oregon and they leave it in the vault. Are they exercising enough control over the item to subject themselves to the use tax in New York or not? And it's not very clear yet. So that might come up as a new issue that might get established. And if you're a vault that has a thousand items with NFT smart contracts and all of a sudden now you've got to charge taxes on all of these transactions. That's again another way that you're going to have to deal with how you're altering those contracts. Um, something else we're seeing in the art world a lot with the NFTs is an effort to make NFTs more exciting again. I think that interest has waned a little bit since 2021. Um, and we've seen a lot of destroying physical art as part of the NFTs. I talked about the copyright infringement NFT, but we've seen a couple of um, NFT sales where either the NFT is a video of the burning of a Banksy, or what, now we're seeing more and more uh, artists selling uh, an NFT with the option that you burn it. Um, Damien Hurst sold, I think, over a thousand, um, well, he created over a thousand works of art and he's selling and he sold them off. And when you buy, you get, you have to choose whether you get the physical or the NFT. And if you choose the NFT, he literally on camera burns the original. And of course, then we have the question of what happens to the copyrights. 
And as copyright lawyers know, the, co the copy is not, um, the copyrights don't go with the item when you sell it by default. So unless the smart contract has said that Damien Hirst is also uh, giving all those copyrights to the person who bought the NFT, he can still make more copies of his work after he's burned it. Um, and how he's representing the permanence of the destruction of the art or whether or not he's going to do that in the future is something that everyone will have to be keeping an eye on. Um, and there's also something uh, in terms of international law, not all countries are like the US in terms of allowing you to destroy artwork. Um, well, US isn't either, but I'll get to that in a minute, sorry. Um, there was a famous uh, NFT made of the burning of a page of Frida Kahlo's diary. Um, and it's not clear whether that was a genuine copy or not. If it's a genuine copy, it might very well be, have constituted a federal crime in Mexico because those works are protected. Um, here in the US, generally, if you buy a painting, you can destroy it if you think that that's worth doing. Um, there is an exception, the VARA Act, um, applies to work that's not made for hire and is produced in fewer than 200 copies. You see it used a lot with public uh, like murals and graffiti art. We see a lot of cases with that um, where the artist can then go after someone for destruction of the work. So, you see, so like I said, you see it a lot with graffiti where someone will, you know, there's a Banksy or someone that not nearly as famous as Banksy paints on the side of a building and then the building, the owner wants to knock down the building and VARA can uh, allow the artist to come in and protect that under certain circumstances. Thank you, Laura, for, for all the uh, very interesting questions. I think um, that covers all the questions I had for today, too. And I was wondering if um, I think we can, we have a few minutes left and we could take some questions from the audience if you have any, any questions. So if Stoner Cats 2, I just love saying the name of the series, if Stoner Cats 2 had issued trading cards with the same advertising language, but just cardboard, printed, embossed, whatever, trade with your friends, maybe people have value. Would that also be a security? Or is it the NFT piece that got them into trouble? It could still be a security in the same way that physical stock shares were a security. I think it depends on how, how well you can convince the court that there's some other value in what you're selling beyond the performance uh, the future performance of the company. Um, we've seen that with the fractional shares of art as well, that you can buy, you know, 1% of a Van Gogh. But yeah, it's whether there's anything of value there other than uh, future profit from the company. From the and maybe following up, do our dealers have to worry about qualifying as security dealers? Uh, if they're selling fractional shares, yes. I mean, there's I, there are various levels of registration requirements. Obviously, if you're only selling off ten, you know, ten shares or something, you can, or or how you advertise or don't advertise. There are various requirements there. But yes, if you're share, selling off a share of any collectible or piece of art, you definitely should be looking at the securities laws around that. I was a bit confused about the Nike case, so. If they were real Nikes, and let's say they didn't use the logo in this hat, so it's basically like a guarantee of some put something in the vault, right? Yeah. And they said uh, you have ownership of uh, Nike product two in mm -hmm. our vault. Then is that a problem? I guess that's what I was no, it's so the, it's the fake part. It's, it's the, the fake part. Even Honestly. if they had a picture of the Nike shoe mm -hmm. to show you what exact shoe you were getting, right, right. it wouldn't be a problem. I it's see. only the fact that it was fake. I it's really running into an issue. Yeah. Um, 
panel was put together by the Art and Cultural Heritage Committee of the International Section of the ADA. Um, we also put out a quarterly newsletter, and there it's usually digital, um, but there are some hard copies in the back if anyone wants a copy. There's also instructions to subscribe there. Um,